spring uh, day about five years ago when I was rector of Mundelein Seminary, Cardinal Francis George, who's my you know, spiritual mentor, came out to speak to all the students. And he gave a talk I've, I've never forgotten. He said, you know, I applaud you guys who are you know, known for your kind of commitment to orthodoxy and teaching the truth of the church. And he really meant it. He wasn't being, you know, coy or anything. I mean, Cardinal George felt very strongly about that, that priests and seminarians knew the teaching of the church. But then he said, remember always that you can't just drop the truth on people and then walk away. In fact, what you have to do is when you place the truth on people, you have to commit yourself now to walking with them and helping them every step of the way to implement the truth you've given them. Now, that was, again, five years ago, long before there were, we had Pope Francis. Well, as I read Amoris Laetitia, the Pope's new letter on uh, marriage and family life, I thought of that speech a lot. And I thought in some ways it provides the light motif of the Pope's letter. The church, if I can put it this way, is extreme in its demand and it's extreme in its mercy. So it holds up a very high objective moral ideal. And it has a very high sense of compassion care for those who are struggling to integrate that high moral ideal. And it's not a zero-sum game. See, that's the trouble. And even a lot of readers of this letter fall into that trap. Is if you say mercy very strongly, that means, oh, you got to dial down the ideal. Or if you, boy, you dial up the ideal, you better dial down the mercy. It's not a zero-sum game. It doesn't work that way. The logic of Catholicism is a radical both-and logic. We make an extreme demand and we express extreme mercy. That, I think, is the key to reading this letter. So, on the one side, is Pope Francis wishy-washy when it comes to the objectivities of sex, marriage, and family? The answer is no. I mean, read the first, oh, two-thirds of that letter. I know it's long, and that's in some ways a problem because people are not going to plow through the whole thing. But read the first two-thirds. What are you going to find? You're going to find the Pope defending authentic marriage as between a man and a woman, lifelong commitment, open children, the standard Catholic uh, view. You're going to find polemics against the ideology of self-invention, which is rampant in the West today. I am you know, who I want to be. I'll decide the person I'm going to become. Pope's against that. The Pope is very strong against pornography, the dangers of pornography. The Pope, maybe surprisingly to some, uh, uh, vigorously reaffirms Pope Paul VI, controversial encyclical, Humanae Vitae, on the, the connection between uh, uh, sexuality and procreation. Pope is very clear about that. The Pope couldn't be clearer that he stands athwart a uh, gay marriage. The Pope says that a gay relationship is not even analogous to what the Church means by authentic marriage. He's dead set against gender ideology, you know, that I can sort of decide what gender I'm going to be. Look in this letter, you're going to find all of that on very clear, unambiguous display. The church is extreme in its demand. It holds up a very high moral ideal. You know, there's kind of a neat um, bridge section between that part and then the, the, the more controversial section, when he talks about um, Paul's great hymn to love in 1 Corinthians, I think it should be required reading for anyone involved in pre-cana, anyone getting ready for marriage. The Pope goes through the famous you know, 1 Corinthians 13 passage, it's often read, by the way, at, at weddings. Um, love is not a feeling, but love is this densely textured act of willing the good of the other, and hence it takes on all these characteristics that Paul talks about. It's not jealous, you know, love is not put on air, love is kind, etc., etc. It's a wonderful meditation on the dense objectivity and demand of love, which is what exactly what engaged couples need to hear. This is not like a little romantic frivolity you're entering into here, but this is a lifelong commitment based upon this very demanding reality of love. Okay, that's in the letter too. Now, having said all of that, and not gainsaying it for a second, this is not a zero-sum uh, game we're playing here. All that remains in place. The Pope, as we well know, is deeply sensitive to the fact that we human beings, finite and fallen as we are, have a very hard time living up always to the great high moral ideal. We are wounded, which is precisely why we need, as he's often said, a field hospital. So there's the church, not there to condemn. So the Pope, as you know, is in polemics, quite rightly against that. The church is simply a thundering policeman 
we're not dealing with the wounded people coming to the field hospital. Rather, now we reach out in love and compassion, forgiveness and mercy to all of us, let's be honest, all of us who have a hard time living up to these very high ideals. Um, so with that in mind, a couple of, of further observations. The one is what, and you got this from John Paul too, what the Pope calls the law of gradualness. Again, it's not the gradualness of the law. It's important. It's the law of gradualness, meaning people tend to move toward the ideal, not all at once, but in steady, gradual steps. Might we even recognize someone who's in a uh, irregular situation in terms of their um, sexual expression, that there are elements of that relationship that are nevertheless good? There are certain dimensions of it that are, are praiseworthy? Yeah. And can we build on that pastorally? Would a simply a blanket condemnation of everything be called for, or would a outreach to those elements of even in a regular situation that are uh, morally praiseworthy not be a better way to do it? So the law of gradualness, which is very good advice for anyone involved in pastoral work. The second great move he makes under this rubric seems to me of, of mercy, is to exploit the classic distinction in our tradition between objective evil and subjective responsibility. Now I admit this maybe is the most controversial part of the letter, but the principle is not really controversial. The principle is a classical one. When you're looking at someone's moral situation, you can assess objectively what's the case here, that, that the lifestyle you're leading, let's say, is objectively irregular, immoral, or less than perfect, whatever term you want to use. But there's a second move though that someone who's assessing it can make which is the degree of one's moral culpability. Now, when you talk about culpability, remember you're talking about, yes, the objective nature of, of the act, but you're also talking about the degree of knowledge the person has and the degree of, of real freedom fully to acquiesce to that. Those two factors can mitigate one's uh, culpability. There are extenuating circumstances that can mitigate one's full culpability. Now, every confessor knows this. I, I've been a priest for 30 years. Anyone that's done confession knows about this distinction. Someone comes and describes an objectively immoral situation. Okay. But see, in confession, that's not the only thing you're assessing. You're assessing culpability. And so the Pope is exploiting, I don't mean that in a, in a cynical way at all, he's exploiting this classical distinction to say, pastors dealing mercifully in the field hospital with those who are failing to live up to the ideal should take into consideration this distinction between the objective uh, assessment and subjective culpability. And I think as far as it goes, that is a altogether valid, legitimate way to go about it. You know, at the end of the day, I, I remember I read the document uh, in, really in, in one sitting. I was on an airplane and I got it the day before it was published and I, I kind of plowed through it, you know, so I could say things about it. Um, I think it was a pretty deft balancing of all the concerns that came up in the two synods. So this is a summary statement of the two family synods. And as you know, there was a lot of debate and there was passionate argument on both sides. And I think the Pope actually pulled off a rather extraordinary balancing of the views that were laid out. And I do think it's in line with that distinctively Catholic logic of the both and.